All right, Acts 1 and 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, he have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Let's pray. Lord, ask you to just be with me. Lord, help me to speak your word. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Use me, please. I pray that the people here would be attentive and God, just meet with us, please. We need to hear from you. We want to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so I, the title of this is, What Do We Do Now? What do we do now? I mean, think about this. They had just spent 40 days with Jesus after His resurrection. That's what verse 3 says. To whom He showed Himself alive after His passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days. Now, why would it be 40 days? I mean, think about that. As I was studying through this, I'm thinking, why, why 40 days? Um, I know we can get into the number 40 is the number of testing and trials and all of that stuff, but I'm, I'm talking about the, the amount of time that 40 days is. I mean, that's a, a long time. Why? Because the, the, the apostles didn't just see Him like once or twice. They saw him regularly throughout that 40 days. I'd say probably likely every day, close to every day. Because after he left, he didn't want to doubt in their mind that they knew he resurrected. That they weren't like, well, did we, did we just like imagine that or did it really happen? No, he's with them for 40 days he spent with them. So they knew without a doubt that he had resurrected. There was no doubt to it whatsoever. So they spent this 40 days with him, and then all of a sudden, he's taken up into a cloud, taken away from them. You know, many times as we serve God, we've probably asked ourselves something like this, well, what do we do now? What now? What next? That's likely what the apostles were asking themselves as they watched the Lord leave them as he ascended back to heaven. Imagine the emotional roller coaster his church has been on. Now think about this. They spent three and a half years with him. And then it's the night the Lord's Supper is instituted. They go into the Garden of Gethsemane to, to pray. He, he asked them to pray with him. And then the soldiers come. And now they arrest him. And the apostles are freaking out. They're all scared because they just saw him get arrested and they all flee probably fearing for their own lives that they would be arrested with him as well then right after that the next day he's murdered so they're sad at his death and they're like well everything he just said it's 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 wrong it's gone what what, what do we do with this now all these promises he gave us all these miracles and he's dead and then three days later he's resurrected and they're joyous and everything's great and they're just amazed at, at wow what he said, I get it now. It's starting to make sense to them. And then the, the blessedness of being taught by him for these next 40 days. It says, uh, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He spends that time teaching his church. Can you imagine? I mean, it amazed me. If Well, somebody came back from the dead, I'd have this question for him and this question. Or people say, well, if someone had come from heaven to tell us, then I'd believe. Well, someone did come from heaven. He did come from heaven. And so this is what they're going through. I mean, this emotional roller coaster. I mean, they're like up and down, up and down, up and down. And now they see him ascend into heaven. Think of the sadness that would be there now. Just, no, Lord, don't leave. You just want to hold on to that moment forever. You ever been as a kid and, and you're just there playing and maybe you let go of a balloon when you're a kid and you just stay there staring, watching it for as long as you can? I mean, till that thing's just so high you can't see it anymore. You're like, I think I see it. You ever done that? I mean, I imagine that's how they were, just watching him go up on that cloud as he's leaving. Just sad and he's gone. What do we do now? You ever felt like that? What do we do now? I imagine that's how they were feeling. 
But Jesus didn't leave them without instruction or what to expect next. He told them. Just like the first church, God expects us as His church to always be witnesses and to wait on His timing to expand His kingdom. That's what He told them. He said, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, he have heard of me. In verse 8, he tells them, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. You're going to be witnesses. So, God expects us today to be witnesses for Him and wait on His timing to expand His kingdom. That's what He told them to wait. He said, wait, and we're going to jump into this Here we'll look at the the, the kingdom aspect of it. Many times, though, the best thing that we can do is to wait for what God has planned out for us. Isn't it hard to wait? Does anybody in here like waiting? No one likes waiting for anything, right? I mean, even if it's like bad news, I'm like, hurry up and give it to me. Just, just, I just want to know. I mean, we're waiting to hear back from for for our, our nieces. Uh, biopsy and, and what it was and it's just like hurry up just tell us i mean if it's just the worst news that can be just tell us we just want to know we want to know what to do next what the next step is just hurry i mean it no one likes waiting i mean if it's good news we're all waiting to hear you know what the luhans are gonna have we want to know tell us tell us where are those cupcakes let's open them Let's bite one. Somebody eat one. So we can see, is it blue or pink? We want to know. I mean, no one likes waiting. But many times, that's what God has planned for us. He says, wait. Be still and know that I am God. I hate being in that position. But because we're so hard-headed, sometimes God says, I'm going to make you be still. You're not going to have a choice. This is what's happening right here. He says, wait. Wait. Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, he have heard of me. Just keep waiting. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. He didn't tell him how many days. He just said, wait. A few days from now, it's going to happen. But he didn't tell him how many days. He said, just wait. So what should they have done? waited right so what do we do now sometimes we just need to wait wait on god wait on what god's telling us they waited expectantly for the promise of the baptism with the holy ghost that's what it says in verse four but wait for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me they were going to need the holy spirit to enlighten them In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13, it talks about which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It talks about that He'd bring all things to their remembrance as they're going to pen the New Testament for us. They had to wait for the Holy Ghost to enlighten them. Somebody help me out with uh, 2 Peter 1.21. Who knows it? But maybe I missed the, the reference, but holy men of God did what? Spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, they had to wait for the Holy Ghost to enlighten them, to teach them. They would need the Spirit to move them. They would need to know when to go, what to do, how to do it. I mean, that's what they were going to need. He said, wait. Do we not still need the same thing today? Don't we still need the Holy Ghost enlightening us and teaching us things and showing us? Amen. Thank God for it. We just read 1 Corinthians 2.13. That's what He does. When we compare spiritual things with spiritual, He's teaching us. I mean, I loved it last night. We got to see the light bulb go off. Amen right there. When we started comparing Scripture with Scripture. and I get it now. I see it. I love when that happens. I love when that happens in my life. I love when that happens in somebody else's life. When they see the light go off, we need the Holy Spirit for that. But we, ju- we also need Him to know when to move. That's why we're praying. We've been praying now for uh, quite a while on this church plant. 
We want to make sure God's in this and God's telling us, hey, it's time to go. Hey, move now. Go with me real quick, Acts 16, verse 6. We're in good company waiting, maybe wanting to do something, and God says no. Or maybe He says yes. But we're in good company. Acts 16, 6 says, Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, God said, you're not going there yet. Well, He didn't tell them yet. It was a yet, but He just said, nope. They were forbidden of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost said, nope, you're not going there. After they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. See, this is what they were wanting to do. Paul and Timothy are wanting to go to, well, they say, let's go into Asia. And the Holy Spirit says, nope. They said, well, you know, we want to go into uh, Bithynia. And the Spirit suffered them not. He didn't allow them to do it. And they, passing by Messiah, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. See, just like they need the Holy Ghost, we do too. We need Him to tell us when to move. They were going to need the Spirit to empower them. We saw that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. So why does God empower us? Why does God empower us? Go ahead, you can answer. What does the verse say? To be a witness. To be a witness. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 28, 18, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. That's the authority. He says, I have the authority. I don't care what the homeowners association says. Okay, I don't care what the, uh, the, the police will tell us. You can't do that. Look, if our government tells us it's illegal to share the gospel... Do we listen? No, we don't. We don't. Why? Because the higher authority said we can. Amen. 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 That's how it works. God said you can. He said, I have all power. And I'm telling you to go. He didn't say there wouldn't be consequences because we can see that in the book of Acts. They obeyed Him. We ought to obey God rather than men. And it did cost them. It's cost Baptists throughout history. So we shouldn't expect it to be any different for us, but we go. They'd need the Spirit to empower them. Romans 15, 19 says, Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. How do you do it? By the power of the Spirit of God. See, we need the Spirit to empower us just like they did. Now as we get into Acts chapter 1, in verse 5, it says, they, they said in verse 4, to wait for the promise of the Father. Well, what was, what was this promise that they were waiting for? Verse 5 tells us, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So what's it talking about? It was the baptism by the Holy Ghost. This was a one-time Baptism done by Jesus Himself, not something that we can repeat. It is not something that we can repeat. This is not so-called spirit baptism into the mystical body of Christ because that doesn't exist. There is no mystical body of Christ. There is no universal church. It does not exist. That is not what this is referring to. They say it happens at the moment of salvation. Well, Jesus said it was a one-time event that was going to happen. He talked about it. Let's go ahead and look at some of these references that mention it. Let's go to Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 11. I know we've hit on this, but I want us to know this. Here's John speaking right here. This is what was being quoted in Acts chapter 1. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Okay, here's John, Matthew 3.11. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He, he who? Jesus, he's gonna, Jesus is going to do what? Baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, I'm telling you, you don't want that second one. You put it in context, that's judgment. 
You don't want that fire baptism. But anyway, I'm not dealing with that. It says that Jesus is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Jesus will do it. Okay, from there let's go to Mark 1.8. Again, John speaking. Let me just, since we're here, I need to hit on this. Because there's those that say that John's baptism is Old Testament. And one verse just does away with that. And it's Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, what does it do? It quotes the Old Testament, as is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Okay, so John and John's baptism is New Testament baptism. It says right there, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it starts with John's preaching and John's baptism. Okay, verse 8 again, same thing we saw in Matthew. I indeed have baptized you with water, but ye shall, be, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. So who's doing the baptizing? Jesus. Jesus is the one baptizing. All right, Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Are we there, Luke 3.16? Alright, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost. Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Ghost. Alright, go to John 1.33. All right, John one thirty three. Sorry, I'm getting there. All right, verse thirty two actually. And John bare record, saying, "I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same as he which baptizeth with what? The Holy Ghost. Who's doing that?" Jesus is baptizing with the Holy Ghost. All right, go to John chapter 4, verse 2. John chapter 4, verse 2. Verse 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. So here Jesus is baptizing more disciples than John now. It seems like things kind of kind of flipped because John John's the one that said it. He must increase, I must decrease. But John had everybody coming out to him. I mean, it said all of Judea was coming out to see what was going on. I mean, they're there to see what's happening with John. And now all of a sudden, hey, the, the table's flipped and Jesus is baptizing more than John is. That's what it said right there. Um, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Get this though. Though Jesus himself, what? Baptized not, but his disciples. Jesus, according to the Bible, never water baptized anybody. So what's the baptism he does? Amen. With the Holy Ghost. Jesus only baptizes with the Holy Ghost. That's it. We read about it on the day of Pentecost when we get into that in in Acts chapter 2. He said, hey, tarry 
till you be endued with power from on high. Wait for the promise of the Father. This is what he's talking about. We just read the four references to it that are mentioned in each of the Gospels. He was prophesying that event that's going to happen. Let me ask you, do we as humans have the ability to baptize with the Holy Ghost? We can't do that, can we? So, go to Ephesians 4, 5 if you would, please. Everybody there? Ephesians 4, 5. All right, two lords, two faiths, two baptisms. That's what it says, right? No? What does it say? One lord, one faith, two baptisms, right? No. It says one lord. How many lords are there? One, right? How do we know? Save your spot. Go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, 4. When you get there, say glory. You got to say it like that too. Okay, that's good. I like that. All right, Deuteronomy 6 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? One Lord. All right, and I, I can, we could chase some cross references and I can prove to you that Jesus Christ is Jehovah. That's what it's talking about right there. But I think everybody here already believes that, so I'm not going to uh, go through teaching that. But he says right there, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay, what did Ephesians 4, 5 say? One what? One Lord. So there's only one. There's not more than one. There's just one. There's one Lord. There's how many faiths? One faith. That's what Jude said. Earnestly contend for the faiths, right? Multiple? No, earnestly contend for the faith. What's he talking about? The set of doctrine that was handed down to you. What the Bible says. There's not multiple faiths. There's not multiple roads to heaven. There's one faith. There's one Lord. There's one faith. And then how many baptisms? One baptism. There's not two. There's not three. There's not multiple. There's one baptism. That's it. That's the only baptism there is for today. This is a church epistle right here, Ephesians. And the only baptism that we can perform, we can't perform Holy Ghost baptism. I'll tell you that right now. We don't have the ability to do that. We can't do it if we wanted to. The only baptism we can perform is water baptism. Now, what's the example you see throughout the book of Acts? What kind of baptism are men practicing? When it says somebody got baptized, it says the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, what did he do? See, here is much water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Why would they need water? Right, that's right. Philip couldn't baptize him with the Spirit. They needed water. The only thing... The Philip could do was baptize him with water. So when we get into Matthew 28, 19 and 20, when it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, doing what? Baptizing them. That was, hey, you, my church, that's who he was giving the great commission to, was his church. That's who he's talking to in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. He says, hey, church, I want you to baptize with the Holy Ghost. That's what he meant, wasn't it? He didn't mean that? No, of course he didn't mean that because they can't do that. Only Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost. All they could do is what? Water baptism. Water baptism. That's all they could do. You guys following me here? You guys are kind of look kind of asleep. Should we do some jumping jacks or something? No, are you guys following me? I want everyone to follow this though because people believe this. They believe this false doctrine of the Holy Spirit baptism. So I want to make sure you guys are following me. This is making sense to you. 
So the only baptism that we can do, like the Lord commanded us to do, is water baptism. That's the only baptism we can do. So when it says one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we have to ask ourselves, what is that one baptism? Now, if someone wants to stand there and say, hey, it's Holy Ghost baptism, if that's the stand that they want to take, I started going down. Ladies are looking cold. I think I went the wrong way. I put it back up. But if that's the stand they want to take, then, okay, stand on that. But explain the rest of the book of Acts when they water baptize everybody. Why are they doing that? Why is that what's taking place? Well, they got two baptisms. So where does all this stem from? Where does all this come about from? It comes about because they believe in a universal church. So who's the head of the universal church? Well, they say it's Jesus. That's why you hear people saying, well, oh, don't go to church, be the church. Well, that's convenient. That's why you see people rebelling against pastoral authority. Well, what's Hebrews 13 talking about? Verse 7 and verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. For they watch for your souls. Well, who's that? If it's a universal church, who is it? When Jesus said, you know, in Matthew 18, hey, go tell it. Let's look there. Go to Matthew 18. So you don't think I'm just saying stuff. I mean, either we can take this literally or we got to spiritualize everything. Either Jesus meant what he said or, or he didn't. All right, Matthew 18, verse 15. You there say, glory. Oh, you guys are good. All right. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, verse 15, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto who? To who? The church. Well, how can you do that? If it's a mystical, universal church, who do you go tell it to? Do you just run outside and say, hey, church, let me tell you. Who, who do you do that to? Who do you talk to? If it's a universal church, who do you tell it to? So see, these guys that want to believe in a spirit baptism, that want to believe in a, a universal church, they have to have two churches. Okay, they have to have two baptisms at least. So it's, it's multi-church. I'm not saying there's, there's many churches. We understand that Jesus is the head of every single local assembly. That's what the Bible teaches. It doesn't ever say the church of Galatia it, it, as a region, the church. No, it says the churches of Galatia. When it's more than one church, it's plural. When it uses the word church of the 114 times, I think, the word church is in the Bible. I think, I want to say it's like three to five times it's used generically in a generic sense. So here, let's grab our, the Bible and go to, um, just go back to Acts chapter 1. Did you grab the Bible? What, the universal Bible? Or each of you have your own Bible? You see what I'm saying? See, I used it in a generic way. I used the word, I said, grab the Bible. Well, we weren't all like, oh, we need to grab the universal Bible that's for the whole world. No one did that, did they? You understood exactly what I meant, didn't you? You said, I'm going to grab my Bible. Okay, so when the word church is used in a generic way, it's just talking about, it could be any church specifically, any, any church whatsoever, it doesn't matter. Go to Ephesians 5, I'll give you another example of that. Ephesians chapter number 5. You following what I'm saying with that? It's just in a generic sense is how the word is used. There is no universal church. How do you tell it unto the universal church? Just some floating around blob out there that we all just get to be a part of. And so now I, don't, I can forsake the assembling of our... Whoa, wait, how can you assemble if you're universal? Hebrews 10.25, throw that out. What assembly? What assembly? See, that's what the word church even means, a called out assembly. Assembly. 
I mean, if we just would understand just the, what the words say and what they mean and would use some common sense, we'd realize the universal church is nonsense. So Ephesians chapter 5. All right, it says, no, oh, let me see. Yeah, that's what I wanted. It says, for the husband is the head of the wife. Well, what husband? The universal husband? Is head of the universal wife? Because th- I'm telling you, you're like, that's stupid, Pastor, right? Who thinks that's stupid? Of course, it's not talking about the universal husband and the universal wife. It's, it, it's talking about any husband and any wife, right? You guys get what I'm saying? Yes, are we following along? All right, I want you to get this. I know it kind of seems like, what's, where's he going with this? Because this is what they teach. that they say, Oh, it's just the universal church. Well, wait, what, what are you talking about? There's no universal church. When the, when the Bible, about the four or five times it uses the word church generically, it's just talking about any church. It could be any church. It's just using it as a generic term. I'm going to the store. Well, obviously, I mean a specific store, but I'm talking about just, I could be talking about any store. I'm going to Walmart, the universal Walmart. No, you'll know it's, it's an actual place by the, by the one I pull into the parking lot and I go to it. Does that make sense? You guys following what I'm saying? Okay, so these people believe that, that there's, you know, multiple baptisms. Doesn't the Bible say Ephesians 4 or 5? We're right there. Go and look at it again. One Lord, one faith, two baptisms, right? No, how many? One baptism. The only baptism we can perform is water baptism. We cannot baptize with the Holy Ghost. Can't do it. So either they need to admit that the one baptism, which is fine, if that's what they want to believe, they're wrong. But if they want to believe it's spirit baptism, at least... You know, at least if it says one baptism, so at least say, stand there and say, then I don't believe in water baptism. And there's some out there that do that. Most of them don't. They'll say, oh, there's, you know, oh, well, it's, that's, you know, that's spirit baptism, but we still, you know, we want to picture it through water baptism. So you have two baptisms. They, they're not going to admit it. I'm telling you right now, they will not admit it that they have two baptisms because just bring them right here and don't let them leave. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. So what's the one baptism? I can at least respect the man if he'll stand there and say, I believe it's spirit baptism and I reject water baptism. You're wrong, but I can at least respect you. The rest of you are just liars to what the text even says. You won't even believe what the text says. And a lot of these guys, I'm a King James Bible believer. I believe every word in this book. A lot of the guys that believe that, that's where they stand. Liar, don't stand here and lie to me telling me you believe every book when it says one. How many is one? It's just one, right? I mean, that's like preschool math. One is just one. So again, we don't have the ability to baptize with the Holy Ghost. Therefore, the only baptism that we as humans can perform is water baptism. This is so important. So important. How can you be so wrong? How can so many preachers be wrong on this? Because they don't want to believe what the book says. Now, is that false doctrine? To believe in a universal church? Amen, it is. To believe in a spirit baptism? Show me spirit baptism. Where is it? And they got one place they'll turn to. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. They forget the context of the chapter. No, we're not looking at the context. We're not going to look at how by the Spirit's used the other six times in the chapter. We're just going to make it say what we want it to say. And disregard the context of the chapter. Disregard the context of the whole rest of the Bible because this, if I pull this verse out of context, I now have a pretext to say what I want to say. And look, bing, spirit baptism, there it is. And universal church. So Jesus started a universal church. That's why he said, go tell it unto the church. Just, you know, just float up in the air. And How can you do that? Look, this is the prevailing thought in Christianity. In Christendom today, it's a universal church. This is what most believe. By the way, where does this doctrine come from? Where does this false doctrine come from? Does anybody know besides Brother Brad? Does anybody know where the false doctrine of the universal church comes from? Who said that? Say it again loud. 
The Catholic Church. Is that where it comes from? Yes. What does Catholic mean? Universal. Universal. See, the Catholic Church just believes we're the universal visible church. By the way, I forget what uh, decree it was. I could look it up. I think it was the Council of Trent, if I'm not mistaken. Whichever one was in the 1500s, I mix them up. Uh, But whichever one it was, they declared that anybody outside of the Catholic Church is lost. They have never rescinded that. Never. Say, oh, our Protestant brethren. You know what Catholics are? Catholics are apostate Baptists. Because there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's just one faith. So at some point, they had to have departed from the faith and became that great whore. That's what it is. They left the one true faith. And now they teach this universal doctrine. They say, we're the universal visible church. Okay, the Protestants, they came out of that. And really, none of the Protestants... It drives me crazy when people want to lift up and magnify Protestants. Like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, all these guys. They were heretics. They taught false doctrine and they wanted to kill us. And some of them did kill us. People that believed like us, they killed us. For the doctrine of the Word of God. And now I'm probably going to teach, it's coming up now here on October 31st, the, what is it, when did he do that, 1517, the, the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation, the start of the Reformation with uh, Martin Luther when he nailed the 95 Thesis to the uh, church door of Wittenberg. It's coming up on the 500th year, so they're going to make a big deal about that. Just read what he wrote in, the, in his catechism, in Luther's catechism, and he's a heretic. He's a lost man going to hell if he believed what he wrote. See, this is why it's so important that we go out there and we talk to people, we define the terms. What do you mean by saved? What do you mean by grace? Catholics believe you're saved by grace. They just redefine it to to be works. The Lutherans do the same thing. I mean, is this not how Satan works? Doesn't he come deceiving? Subtly, isn't that how he came to to Eve? The serpent was more, what, subtle? Was more blunt and obvious? No, he wasn't blunt and obvious. He was more subtle than any beast of the field. And he deceived Eve. The woman being deceived was in transgression. He deceived her very subtly. It, It sounds so close to the truth. But he deceived her. That's how Satan works. So people will get all up in arms. I'm telling you, when people get mad, if you preach against, you know, Billy Graham, against Martin Luther and, and uh, John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli and all these so-called Protestants who are the greatest things ever, and you preach against some of the church fathers and stuff, they get all up in arms. I'm t- I'll tell you why right now, why they get all upset is because they don't know the Bible. That's why they get upset. They don't know the Bible and they don't know what those men believed. They've never looked into it. They've just been told by a bunch of preachers that they're, oh, they're so great, they're amazing. Got so-called Baptists saying, oh, we came out of the Reformation. You're a fool. You don't even know, you don't know nothing if, if you believe that. That Baptists came out of the Reformation. We recovered the gospel. What are you talking about? It was lost? You tell me the gospel was lost? Go to Ephesians 3.21, please. They're going to have to stop doing that or fix this. Ephesians 3.21 says, Unto Him be glory in the church. Local, universal. Which one? Local or universal? You sure? All right, just checking. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout what? All ages. That means... That Jesus Christ will receive glory in His church throughout every age. Now, I don't know if some of you see the significance of that. I hope you do. I hope you see how important this is. And you understand how important this is. And I, You know, if you think that, man, pastor makes too big a deal of this, that's a problem. If the pastor talks too much about this, that's a problem if that's what you're thinking. Because this will guard us from false doctrine. This will guard us from from leaven coming in and destroying what we are. Jesus said in His Word, God said in His Word, that 
Jesus Christ would receive glory in the church throughout all ages. That means there will never be a time when He's not being glorified in His church. Never. Never. Through all ages, take it on into eternity. Never. There will never be a time He's not being glorified in His church. That means it had to have always been here. That means there was never a time it wasn't here. That means the gospel didn't have to be recovered. Do you know that? That means we've always had the gospel. There's always been a line of true churches. Always. It's never not been. That's why the doctrine of Christ is so important. That doctrine of the laying on of hands. I mean, some people don't like this, but that means it had to go from one man who had hands laid on him to another man that had hands laid on him all the way through. And they're going to say, that's apostolic succession. That's what the Catholic Church teaches. We're not teaching apostolic succession. We're not saying it went from one pope to the next and it had to touch like that. No, but it did have to go from man to man who was ordained. From man to man. Boom, 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 boom. Had to happen. Or Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 is wrong. So what is it? See, he'd get glory in the church throughout all ages. That means there's always been churches that have held the biblical doctrine. There's always been churches that have held to the doctrine we hold to today. And they might not have always had the name Baptist, but they had Baptist doctrine. Always. And that's why we're here today. You say, well, you can't trace it all the way through. No. So by faith, I believe what God says. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So I just trust God and say, amen, then they have the doctrine, they hold to the doctrine. Obviously, it's come all the way down. Obviously. I forget who, who, who it was that said it. It might have been Charles Spurgeon talking about the, the Rhine River, I believe is which one it was. But there's times when the Rhine River will go underground and you can't see it. And then there's times when it comes back up and you can see it. And that's the same thing with our lineage. There's times it may go and disappear and we can't trace it, but then, boom, you got these group of believers pop up over here that hold the same doctrine that we do. But we can't trace it all the way to right here. There was a gap. We couldn't trace it. But you've got those believers there believing the same thing. These believers here believing the same thing. We've got the Word of God saying His church will be here throughout all ages. Amen. Then by faith, I believe that right here when we couldn't see it, there were still believers practicing and doing the same thing because His church would be here throughout all ages. That's no universal church. That's a local New Testament assembly that holds to the doctrine of Christ. That's what that is. This is I'm telling you, this is so important that we get this, that we would be grounded in this. And I was like hammering on this last night in, in the Bible Institute because we need to get it. Because I don't want the next generation to leave here and not understand this and not know this. I, I, I didn't come up knowing this stuff. I had to slowly like compile it and be taught it and bring these things in. I didn't have somebody sitting there teaching me saying, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. It took me years to get all of this. And I'd get a piece here and a piece here and a piece here and a piece here and a piece here until finally I was able to put the pie together. And that's why I got rebaptized and ordained. It wasn't a rebaptism though, it was a one true baptism. Amen. Amen. That's why I did it. Because I finally put the puzzle together and I said, there it is. We got to get this right. And that's what it's about. I mean, if it's a spirit baptism, then I don't need laying on of hands. Because we're all the church. Who's going to lay hands on me? I'm, I'm, I'm ordained of God. I'm just like John. You didn't have the Bible prophesying about you. John was prophesied about. He came to prepare the way for the Lord. God told him, hey, the one you see the dove lighting on, that's him. And John said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He was preparing people for the Lord, preparing hearts for the Lord. How? By preaching repentance, baptizing them. See, John brought the materials for the first church. John prepared the materials for the first church. Jesus Christ started his church. I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Do we believe that? I hope so. Yes, I believe it. Okay, then our job should be, well, where is that church? 
See, that's what got me going on all this. I saw these things. I'm like, okay, hey, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So his church is here. Where is it? And I start reading in the Bible and I've seen these things. This is what a church should be. This is what it should be. So let me find that. Where's that at? It's got to be here. Jesus said it was going to be here. He said it'd be here throughout all ages. So where is it? I want to identify with it. I want to be a part of that. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Baptism is more important than we think. You had a famous independent fundamental Baptist said, I wouldn't die for baptism. His name was Curtis Hudson. I wouldn't die for baptism. It's because you don't believe it. You're not a Baptist. You don't hold to the doctrine. It's not important to you. You don't think it's necessary. A lot of these guys think you can just start a church out of, you can just hold to the doctrine and say, hey, we're a Baptist church. Let me change the name on the sign. We're Baptist now. Okay, how about if we took the name Baptist off? Why are we Baptist? Oh, the Bible, okay, that's a generic answer. They'll say the same thing. Prove it to me why we're a Baptist. What makes us Baptist? What makes us a Baptist church? Forget, lose the name. That's it. Our baptism. Our baptism. Our baptism makes us Baptist. Let me see here. Hmm. Give me just a second. I don't always remember all these references here. Go to Matthew, please. Our baptism makes us Baptist. In a nutshell, that's what it is. We take Baptist off the sign. Are we a Baptist church? And why? Matthew 21, 23. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priest, this is Jesus comes into the temple. The chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, by what authority doest thou these things? See, that's what the question always is. What authority do you have to do this? Who gave you permission? Could you imagine asking God? Really, can you imagine asking God? That would be like if you walk into your house and you, you go in and there's a stranger sitting on your couch and the stranger looks at you and says, who let you in here? You'd be like, what? I mean, if you didn't freak out, but if you saw a stranger sitting on your couch and they're like, who let you in here? What are you doing in here? Who gave you authority to come in? You're like, well, this is my house. I've got the key. Who let you in? Okay, now that's a a simplified illustration, but you kind of get the point. Because they asked Jesus, the God that created them, by what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask one, you one thing, which if ye tell me, and likewise I will tell you what, by what authority I do these things. Verse 25, here it is. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. What did he ask them? John's baptism, was it of heaven or of men? That's what it comes down to. Our baptism. Our baptism is what makes us Baptist. You can say you're Baptist all you want, but if you don't have John's baptism, you ain't a Baptist. And I know that's bad English, but you ain't a Baptist if you don't have the right baptism. Let's look at Mark 1 again. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So this is the beginning of the gospel. It says, verse 4, John did what? Baptize. That's the beginning of the gospel. John was baptizing. Go back to Acts chapter 1, please, if you would. Acts chapter 1. Verse 
It says, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, look, I want you to see what's, bap- what's, what's sandwiched between this statement right here, them asking about if the kingdom's going to be restored to Israel. And verse 3, it says in verse 3, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to what? The kingdom of God. And then they ask in verse 6, Are you going to restore at this time the kingdom to Israel? Now what's sandwiched between that? What does verse 5 talk about? John's baptism. Now, I want us to understand this as well here, if we would, what our baptism puts us into God's kingdom, which is this assembly right here. The visible manifestation of God's kingdom today is the local New Testament church. It's important we understand that because my kingdom is not of this world. He instructs them at this time as they're asking him if he's going to restore the kingdom to Israel. That the timing of that isn't important right now. He says, I want you to wait. The timing's not important for when the kingdom's going to be restored to Israel. The reason is because God wants us and them to mainly focus on the here and now, not what's going to be. Now, it's not that he's against the what's going to be, but he says, I want you to focus on what's right here in front of you. Get busy serving me now. We'll, we'll wait on that. He just kind of postponed them on it. But even in that, he's teaching them of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, what some people want to do is they want to make the kingdom of God all future. There's nothing, nothing to do with right now. But the Bible's going to dispel that for us here. They wanted the promises. What the, the apostles wanted is they wanted the promises of the millennial kingdom now. They wanted the rod of the iron rule of God right now. That's what they were asking about. You're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But God had already established His kingdom through His churches. Now you're saying, well, how do you know that? Let's go to Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. All right, this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel's interpreting these four empires, these four kingdoms. The fourth kingdom, it says in verse 40 of Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. All right, so this fourth kingdom is Rome. It goes on. Verse 42 says, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Again, they who? Some people want to say, well, this has already taken place. The, uh, the, the ten toes are what verse 44 is talking about. Well, who, who did they mingle themselves with the seed of men? Who's the they? That hasn't happened yet. I'm telling you, it's still future. Some of you are like, what's he talking about? Okay, the, these ten toes and what it's talking about in verse 43. Thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They who? The seed of men mingle themselves with the seed of men? Who's the they? Now, I just if you want to study more, look at Genesis 6-4. Who are the, uh, the sons of God with the daughters of men? Who is that? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So there's some sort of mixing going on there, likely with some fallen angels with mankind. Okay, and it's going to be fallen angels. Angels are always men in the Bible with women on earth. Okay, but now, anyway, moving on, verse 44, and in the days of these kings, what kings? Well, some want to say, oh, it's the, the, the ten kings. No, it's not. And I'll prove it to you that it's not because of what Jesus said in Luke. But it says, and in the days of these kings, so we'd say, well, what kings? Well, the Roman kings. In the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven, what's he going to do in the days of these kings? He's going to set up a kingdom which shall what? So it's, once, it, once this kingdom's set up, it's not going to be gone, right? 
It'll never be destroyed. That means it's going to be here. Isn't that almost like what he said about the church? In Ephesians 3.21, in Matthew 16.18, isn't that what he said about the church? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus will have glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Right? Isn't that what it said? And now it's saying about this kingdom, it's going to be set up in the days of these kings, and it shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So, this kingdom is going to be set up in the days of these kings. Who? The days of what kings? The kings of Rome, right? you got to follow with me. You stay with me. The, the, the Caesars, that's right. Is Caesar's just another name for king. Okay, so in the days of the Caesars. Now, let me ask you, who was ruling the world when Jesus was born? Caesar. Who would that be? What kingdom is that? Rome. Rome. So what did God say in the days of these kings? Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed? So, if that kingdom set up, it had to be in the days of the kings of Rome. And I'm going to prove to you it's not the ten kings, the ten toes. It's not talking about in those days, because that's what some want to say to make it futuristic. Say, oh, it's all, it's all still in the future. It hasn't happened yet. That'll happen revelation during the tribulation and all that. That's when that kingdom is going to be set up. And the, see, see, they look and they see the whole thing is future. And it'll be when Jesus comes back at his second coming, then he's going to set up his kingdom. Only the problem with that is that you've got Jesus saying otherwise. And it kind of messes things up when you look at what the Lord said and compare it with what he said in Daniel chapter 2. So again, just to remind us, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. Now, if you would, go to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. I'm not, you should have written down those references right there. Daniel 2.44. And this one right here, Luke 22, verse 29. All right. Now, this is the Lord's Supper. They just had the Lord's Supper. So who had the Lord's Supper? Who was it? Who was there? Brother Brad, stop answering. <laughs> stop answering. <laughs> it was the church, okay? That's who he's having the Lord's Supper with, his church. Okay, and so now he's having this conversation with them. It says in verse 29, Jesus is speaking to his church, and he says, And I appoint unto you a what? A kingdom. So that's how we know it's not yet future. Jesus did it when? In the days of what kings? The Caesars. The days of Rome. Jesus set up his kingdom. And I appoint unto you a kingdom. He gave it to his church. As my father hath appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table. Where does that happen? That's right. The Lord's Supper. You could cross-reference out 1 Corinthians 10.21. You can eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes. So, where's his kingdom today? So Brother Brad can't answer. Where's his kingdom today? That's right. It's right here. It is right here. That's where his kingdom is at today. He said, I appoint unto you a kingdom. Who did he give it to? His church. This is the visible manifestation of his kingdom. We could look at it like an embassy. I like that. That makes sense. What, what is an embassy? Who knows what an embassy is? That's right. What's it considered, though? If we went to a U.S. embassy in, I don't know, any other country in Africa, what, what's it like? If you walk onto that soil, what is it considered? It's considered U.S. soil. Okay, that's how it is. I mean, that's why people will, you know, even here there's embassies for other countries and they'll seek asylum in that assembly. And, you know, they can be protected even if they've broken laws here. They can go into that uh, embassy and they'll be protected if the government chooses to leave them there and not let them out because they're it's like they're on that soil. So it's like, we could say it like this, a kingdom in a foreign land. That's what we have right here in this church. We're in a kingdom in a foreign land. 
See, that's why there's a separation of church and state. That's why. It's two different kingdoms. You can't tell us what to do. Another thing, you don't have the authority to do. Who's the higher authority? Is it the United States of America? Or is it the Lord Jesus Christ who set up His kingdom here? That's why, honestly, the, the state has nothing to do with it. You can't tell us anything. Get out. This is another kingdom. And that's why the Caesars got all mad at Christians. That's why they were killing them, because they, oh, they recognize some other king. Not you, Caesar. And that's what Caesar's like, well, you've got to throw that pinch of salt or that pinch of incense to me as an offering, as a God. And they said, we can't do that. We're not giving our allegiance to you. We'll, we'll honor and obey the laws that you have here as long as you let us do what our king says. But once you step over the bounds and you try and make us do something that, that our king says we shouldn't do, then you're wrong. We're not going to do that because there's two separate kingdoms. There's a separation right there, a separation of church and state. Now, Matthew 21, 43 says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Who's he talking to? He's talking to, um, if I'm not mistaken here, a bunch of Pharisees, a bunch of religious uh, Jews is what he's talking to here. And he says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So this kingdom of God is going to be given to another nation. What's that nation? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to 1 Peter 2.9. We're almost done. Don't you worry. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I want us to understand all this. I know I'm giving you a lot, but it's important we get this. Again, we need to think of New Testament churches as embassies in a foreign land. All right, now Matthew, I think it was 21, said that uh, the kingdom of God is going to be given to another nation. You think, oh, so only one nation is going to get the kingdom? Okay, let's look at 1 Peter 2.9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy what? Nation. And holy nation. There it is. He's giving it to his churches. That's who he's giving it to, your holy nation. In John 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. See, that's we're embassies here. We're pilgrims here. God's kingdom isn't of this world. We're, we're just passing through. We're here temporarily. And He's got embassies stationed everywhere. There's a New Testament church. It's an embassy of His kingdom, a representative of His kingdom. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. That's what we are. We're strangers and pilgrims in this land. If you study the word strangers out in the Bible, a stranger, it's talking about an illegal immigrant, if you want. An immigrant is what it's talking about. When you read it, oftentimes in the Old Testament, it says, uh, take care of the stranger. What's it talking about? Someone that's not a Jew. That's what it's talking about, a stranger. That's what we are. We're foreign citizens here. We're strangers. And we're pilgrims. A pilgrim's just passing through. A stranger. We don't belong to this world. That's why we need to be careful with our allegiance to America. We're pilgrims here. This isn't our nation. We belong to... We have another king. We have another king. And by the way, it's not the Bill of Rights either. As much as I love the Bill of Rights... The Bill of Rights only recognized the rights that God had already given to every man. That's all it did. The government, the U.S. government didn't make those. They just recognized these are natural born rights. That's, they, it even says it in those documents. These are natural rights that every person should have. Just being born, you have these. They're endowed by our Creator. Given to us by our Creator. So our allegiance isn't to America. Our allegiance should be to the Lord's kingdom, to the Lord's church. 
Not any country. That's why we should be able to meet brothers from another country and we're instantly connected with them. Now we shouldn't be saying, hey, just blow them all up. Make the desert, make that desert glass. What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? They came after America. America. I can't stand that. I'm serious. Why? Because that's just foolishness. You're not even thinking. You're not even using your brain when you start talking like that. You're a blind nationalist that will follow whatever your country says to do, and that's wrong. I'm a patriot, amen? But I'm, I don't think everything America does is right, either. Amen. amen. That's why I've said it before, and, and people got offended at it. But my son would have to join the military against my wishes. And I'm not, I don't hate someone that's joined the military. I'm not against them. But I would not let my son join the military. He would have to do it against my wishes. It'd be, I don't want you to, son. No, don't do it. And if he did, I'm not going to stop him. But hey, go ahead. Then if you're going to do it, you don't have my blessing. My daughters, I would physically stop them. No business in the military. Why? We don't belong to this kingdom. I'm to this kingdom. We belong to this kingdom. Uh, you, you understand what I'm saying, I hope. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? I know that I've t- touched on so many things today. Anybody have any questions? Randy, you all right there? <laughs> Go ahead, brother. That's what I think it's saying. I don't know what else it could be saying. Yeah. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Well, they who? Mingle. How do you mingle with the seed of men? What, that's got to be some sort of procreation taking place. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. Anybody else? Any questions? I, I'm serious. I touched on a lot. I know. So if you have some, please ask. If you're confused about something, ask away. We're good. Makes perfect sense. You could teach it. Yeah? No? All right, let's pray.